Kilo Kisiwani. The word Kilo is coming from a Arabic language. It means Kilo, it means the balance. Uh, the islands are uh, indigenous were Africans. Praying, I mean, it's make echo sound. Allo, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. So the sound goes in and come back. All people behind can hear, uh, can hear it. It's like a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Hamjambo habari zenu. I'm very happy to be here with you today and greetings from the coastal town of Kilwa Kisiwani. Kilwa Kisiwani is a very important and ancient city or town here in Tanzania. It has had many great leaders in the past, from indigenous African kings and queens, to the Portuguese, to Omani sultans, to the British, and even during the German colonial times. Today you are going to learn more about this ancient town here in Tanzania. So if you're new to the channel, I'll appreciate it if you can consider liking, sharing, and subscribing to the channel by clicking on the red box below this video that says subscribe. Karibuni Tanzania, Karibuni Kilwa Kisiwani. Today we are on a remarkable journey. Tunatembea Kilwa Kisiwani. Let's travel to Kilwa Kisiwani. It's an island and a national historic site and a hamlet community located in the Kilwa district in the Lindi region in southern Tanzania. Kilwa Kisiwani is the largest of the nine hamlets in the town of Kilwa Masoko and is the least populated hamlet in the township with at less than a thousand residents. At its peak, Kilwa hosted over 10,000 inhabitants in the Middle Ages. Since 1981, the entire island of Kilwa Kisiwani has been designated as a World UNESCO Heritage Site, along with its nearby ruins of Sangum Mnara. Despite its significance and historic reputation, Kilwa Kisiwani is still home to a small and resilient community of native residents that have inhabited the island for centuries. Kilwa Kisiwani is one of the seven World Heritage Sites located in Tanzania, East Africa. Kilwa Kisiwani. The word Kilwa is coming from a Arabic language. It means Kilo. It means the balance. Uh, the islands are uh, indigenous were Africans. I mean the local people were Africans or the Swahili people. They were very charming, welcoming anyone to trade on the island. As traders, the local people were going to the mainland from this island. They collect gold, ivory, rhinoceros horns, leopard skins, timber, slaves, and other stuff that were obtained from the mainland they brought to this island. When they collected on the island, they had good connections with the Asians, the traders. The Chinese were coming with the Chinese porcelain. Uh, also silky clothes, they coming to exchange with gold, rhinoceros horns, leopard skins. Indonesians were coming with the, some silky clothes, uh, food spices, they coming to exchange with gold. Traders from India, they were coming with the uh, spices like uh, Iriki, Abdalassin, Girigiriani from India. Also they took um, uh, beads for making ornaments so they were coming to exchange with gold slaves uh, ivory even nowadays if you go to India in Goa you can find a lot of black people like me but they speak Indians because they slept there for a long time generation and generation have been continued to to be there uh, traders from Saudi Arabian countries were coming with perfume glassware coming to exchange with gold, uh, timbers, and slaves. This connection of trade between Kilwa, Middle East, and Far East started early before 7th century AD. But on this island of Kilwa Kisiwani, the Sultanate was established around the 11th century by someone called Hassan bin Ali, came from Iran, from the town called Shubrazi. He came and he bought the island from local chief and for the first time he introduced the Sultanate 
uh, copper coins also introduced the stone buildings. So today we are going to see the old stone buildings from 11th century onwards up to 18th century. But uh, to see the buildings from 11th century doesn't have meaning that the society on this island started to live here from 11th century. No, the society were here before 11th century but they constructed their buildings from simple material. They constructed from the wall were coming from poles and the muddy and the roof were coming from palm leaves. So those buildings were not, so, not, were not strong enough to survive to nowadays, except the copy from that style is still exist. Uh, this is why we'll see the most uh, strong buildings that were constructed from stony structure came from 11th century onward up to 18th century but here we are now we are at the graveyard at that time people were passing away and we are buried too all of these are graves graves are into design graves for communist people they just put a grave, uh, stone up and down to show someone is buried between from this stone to this one to show someone is buried between but there are graves for vip like sultan or those related with the sultan were well constructed and planted as this one here so these ones are for like the royal people royal people. okay just to say as a cop even for nowadays no more people they just place it on up and down those royal people like uh, the leaders for example, our president uh, uh, has a very beautiful grave. Eh? Yeah. You see, uh, even at that time, it was the same. So, so, so the leaders were placed in the, uh, I mean, were buried and beautiful grave were constructed like this one. Like this one, okay. Unaongea Kiingereza vizuri bwana. So down here we have a mosque called it Malindi Mosque. Well, Malindi Mosque constructed around the 15th century. Malindi is the name of town existing north of Kenya, Kenya. north of Mombasa in Kenya. Yeah. So traders from Kenya were coming to trade here around the full fort uh, around 15th century were impressed to construct this mosque and they named it Malindi Mosque. So they named the mosque after their city Malindi. Yes. Okay. So they because they came from Malindi city, so they came here for trade in order to memorize the place that they came from, they named this uh, mosque Malindi. But to pray in was for everyone. Okay. Just they name the name Malindi in order to memorize the place they came from. Okay. Before you come inside the mosque, you needed to wash your hands and feet. So there is a water tank. The next is a water well. You take water, you wash your hands and feet. So this is where they made wudu or yeah, ablution wudu. here? Yes, yeah. ablution area is here. That's here. So this is what it looks like, guys. So these were wells? Yeah, it's a water well. Water well. Those are staircases going to the minaret. Someone is going on top, then calls for praise. Allah, but Allah, but Allah, but Allah, but people get the message. Then they coming in. They take wudu, and then they come on this tiny stone to dry their feet, and then they come in the prayer room. Okay. There are two room here. This one for men. The next room there is for women. And okay. every month we should have this chamber. Call it Migram or Kibla. It shows make a direction because all Muslims during praise uh, are needed to face to Mecca. Mecca. So here, if you see by the leader of prayers, we call it Imam. Imam is supposed to stand here while other prayers comes online behind him. When he's praying, it make echo sound. Allo, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. So the sound goes in and come back all people behind can hear, uh, can hear it it's like a microphone yeah, yeah. it's had a flat roof supported by these uh, pillars and wooden beams on top 
We see the holes over there where the wooden beams lay to support the flat roof. Although the mosque came from, was constructed around the 15th century by the Malindi people, but uh, around the 18th century when the Oman gained control of Kilwa, they did a renovation for this mosque and they continued to use it. Okay. So when was this mosque uh, stopped being used? At the end of 18th century, traders shifted out of this island. They went to set at Kilwa Kivinje. So uh, very few fishermen were remained here okay. who didn't manage to continue using this mosque because there were so many mosques. Totally, there were 99 mosques on this so, island. Yes, okay. so they were using like one uh, one mosque. Yeah, so this one was real abandoned. Okay. So, so this is what inside the mosque would have looked like guys we're actually walking and standing on ancient ground here in the Malindi mosque and you can see this section would have been for men and then like uh, Pathmani has said to us here there would have also been a section for the women here now this is what it looked like and you would have also had the view of the coastal side here in Kilwa Kisiwani. there was a door but the door is closed by the archaeologist through this door you could come in yeah. for the washroom washroom it's a water tank which is in here okay so here used to be like a slat yes. uh, toilet area it was here okay this is what it would have looked like Right here. So would this have been the staircase? No, it's a it's a, a pit. A pit. Yes, where you drop your things. It, oh, okay. So this so would have, is closed. It's covered up now. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this would have been the pit area here. Really ancient building. It still survive today. Remarkable. So you say this building was built in the 15th, 15th century. century. Wow. Yeah. And it's still standing today. Yeah. Very strong. Strong. Yeah. Say 600 years ago. 600 years ago. Wow. Yes. And is this building here a school? No, it's a private. Okay. Normal. Okay. Uh, resident. Resident. Uh, okay. okay. But this is a school for mad uh, for kindergarten we call madrasa madrasa and they will learn the quran here yes. okay so this is the local madrasa on the island so this is fort it's well known as a gereza the most prominent building can be seen clear from the mainland. Yeah. The building was constructed around 1505 by the Portuguese. And this was the first Portuguese building to be constructed on the Indian Ocean. Wow. It was constructed around 1505. Uh, by this time, uh, Kilua was, co uh, was uh, conquered, where it was taken over by the Portuguese. But the first Portuguese to come here was named was Vasco da Gama. He came at the end of 15th century. Okay. So uh, he took the information about the Indian Ocean, especially about Kilwa, he sent to Portugal. Okay. So uh, after that, uh, the Portuguese uh, were, came around 1505, they bombed the island and took over. After to take over the island, they constructed the fort and some soldiers remained here to protect this as a new Portuguese colonial rule. Later on, the Portuguese were shipped out by the Omanis uh, around the 1700, I mean around the end of uh, 
um, I mean, around in 1698, where the Portuguese control was ended down in East Africa. Okay. Coast. So where the Omani gained control after the Omani to take control, the Omani they did a re reconstruction for this uh, fort. They placed the door into this style and they placed the tower to round the structure and the decorations on top of the tower there. Okay. So uh, to make it beautiful. So we can go inside to okay. see more. Uh, I've noticed like on the top there, there's an Arabic writing that says Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Yes, in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Right. And down there, there is uh, inscription to add to the Holy Quran. It says, Inna, inna fatihna laka fatih al uh, It means that. Verily, God. Uh, uh, open it for you uh, uh, um, and keep it and reveal it uh, into well condition. Okay. Yes. So this is what the Omanis will have placed here once they had took, taken over from the Portuguese. Yes. Okay. had a, a, a control of this island at one time? No, just they had connections with, of trade. Okay. The French slave trader called Maurice he made an agreement with the Sultan or, or the Omani Sultan. Okay. I mean the Sultan was placed by the Oman around the, the end of 18th century. Uh, he, he received 80 cannons from the French slave trader Maurice uh, for the purpose that uh, Sultan could protect himself, never anyone could come and take over the island again. Okay. And uh, Maurice could get benefit of buying slaves for every year from Sultan of this island of Kilwa. Okay. And then he could take slaves from Kilwa. Maurice could take slaves from Kilwa to Mauritius, the reunion, and Madagascar for uh, working for sugar and coffee plantations. French colonies. Okay. Yes, and then they were taking those products to go to and not in France. Then they supplied to different parts of Europe. Of Europe. Of Europe. That time. Okay. Archaeologist in Nelchitic for the purpose of taking away the rubble that the rubble were half covered the, uh, the mosque after the island to be abandoned the buildings that were beside the mosque some of them were collapsed okay. so when the archaeologist arrived he found uh, the mosque is half in the rubble so he decided to take the rubble away okay. so he was collecting the rubble putting on this cocoa pen and pushing it dump to the sea and then uh, it revealed all the mosque out so we'll see it okay so what do you know the year he brought this machine uh, he came around the uh, he brought around in 1958 1958 okay but he spent about seven years to work on this island and song of nara too okay. uh, yeah because uh, 
uh, the main part he, the, he worked is Songo Mnara and Kilwa Kisiwani. Okay. Yes. And where was he from? Uh, United Kingdom. United Kingdom. Yes. Okay. And like, did he speak the local language like Swahili? Um, I hope so because when you stay with the locals for seven years, you must adapt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially when you need to do something with them. So to simplify your work, you have to adapt. So I think, I hope he adopted. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there are two staircases going to the upper floors, to the second floor, and those over there, there were staircases. Just um, we are going to the third floor. The third floor. Okay. Yes. So these are all the staircases to the upper floors of the. Yes. I would have been a long time ago and you can see it is still very much strong it still stands today and this is what it would have looked like I'm sure in its heyday this would have been a really grand and beautiful building here especially when you can see everything that's happening on the coast so from here you can see everything that's happening on the mainland in Kilo Masoko which is out there in the distance So who were the indigenous people of this island? Because before the um, people from, say, Oman or Shirazi yes. and um, Portuguese came here, there were indigenous people here. Who, who were they? Do you know? They were the Swahili people. The Swahili people? Yes, uh, those who were indigenous of this island. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Friday mosque. Uh, Friday mosque is the Greek or the biggest mosque on this island. Okay. It was constructed uh, around the the first part was constructed around the eleventh century, one thousand years ago. That is the in front side. Wow. It was constructed by Sultan Hassan uh, Hassan uh, bin Ali, the first Sultan of Kilwa. But later on, the number of prayers was increased so much. Then they decided to add this part. was added by Sultan Al Hassan ibn Sulaiman. He was a very famous Sultan of Kilwa. During his lifetime, he got opportunity to meet with Muhammad ibn Battuta, the great Moroccan traveler, yeah. around 1331, 
on this island. Right. And the only Sultan of Kilwa who introduced the gold coins during his lifetime around the 14th century. And the only Sultan of Kilwa that introduced the, the biggest palace than all sub of Sahara around the 14th century. The only Sultan of Kilwa extended accommodation to Songo Mnara Island around the 14th century. So uh, he had a private entrance where when he comes in the mosque, he used this door to come in, he wash hands and feet from there, then he got to pray. But on his way back out of the mosque, poor people were kept online waiting for him. He gave them new clothes as a sadaka for each one. Okay. And one day, one of the poor people asked him, please, Sultan, I want your clothes that you dress it. Sultan went inside the mimbar and he changed his clothes and he gave the clothes to that poor people, okay. this poor guy. So then uh, uh, that poor guy said, okay, thank you, uh, Sultan. And then he, he went with those clothes, put clothes and keep them on their on the head and go with them at his home. Okay. So uh, uh, it looks like, it shows like uh, this Sultan was very, very kind. Or uh, among of the sultans who ruled the Kilwa. Yeah. So we can go inside the more. Wow. So this this mosque is over one thousand years old. This side here is seven. I mean, this is, comes from fourteenth century. Fourteenth century. It means seven hundred years ago. Would have been the first part of the mosque. Yes. Wow. It was support. Uh, it had a flat roof supported by wooden beams and wo uh, wooden pillars. Then, around the 14th century, the number of prayers was was increased so much. So then they needed to have more space for praying in. So they decided to add this point. So this point was added around the 14th century 14th. by Sultan. Al Hassan bin Suleiman. Okay. Very famous Sultan of Kilo that introduced the gold coins during his life. So this island had their own gold coins? Yes. Wow. And um, you said, I, I, I've heard his name many times, you said the Moroccan um, explorer Ibn Batuta, Batuta he, came, Ibn Batuta came, he here, came here as well. Around 1331. Wow. And he, Ibn Batuta prayed also inside this mosque. In this mosque? Yes. Wow, this is historic, guys. So before to come inside this mosque, you needed to wash hands and feet. If they are short, so here, um, this would have been the wudu area. Yeah, uh, it's the ablution area. Ablution. It's the water tank. The middle is the water well. Then the next is the water tank. You take your water. You wash your hands and feet. You dry your feet on this sandstone down here. Then you come inside the mosque. Okay. And here there were staircases going to the minarets. Someone goes on top and calls for praise. Allah for Allah for people coming to pray when they get this sound. But for development nowadays, for yeah. the modern mosque, yeah. there is no minaret like this. They have been replaced by microphone and speakers. Microphone yeah. speakers, okay. So this is a great house from the 15th century. Okay. 600 years ago. The buildings were constructed very close between each other. That you can touch this wall and this wall. So we can touch the great mosque wall mm -hmm. and the great house wall wall yeah. and this is a street here wow yeah. so who would have been living in this house would this have been the sultan's house no this is not a sultan's house this is a, a merchant's house merchants yes okay so this is where the merchants would have been staying of course it's in ruins now but you still have the foundation which still stands i'm sure a lot of evacuations would have happened here by the archaeologists but this is what it looks like guys A 
and right next to the merchant's house this will have been the grand mosque of Kilwa okay Friday mosque and this will have been the biggest mosque on the island in, in its heyday I'm sure this will have been a really grand grand structure to place your eyes on and you can still see it in the beams of the building here absolutely stunning architectural designs the acoustics would have been amazing when they do the call to prayer and they do the prayers you know back then it wouldn't have been microphones so you would have had to design the building in a way which the sound echoes very well so people can hear the words that are being recited And just like the smaller moss we had seen previously, this year would have been the Qibla. And I guess it faces towards Mecca, the Kaaba. And this is where the Imam or the Sheikh would have been leading the call to prayer. And the congregation would have been standing behind. And all the way down there would have been people. This section, like Othman was saying, is over 1,000 years old. The ground is not level, you see, from down there, the mosque is down, here is up. Yeah. Because uh, before uh, to be abandoned, all these areas that are buildings for 12,000 people, uh, then the island was abandoned, the buildings collapsed, laid on the mosque, and the archaeologists excavated the mosque. This is why the mosque is looks to be down okay and we are up a little bit yeah. because this area we stand it is not excavated but the mosque down there is excavated it's, it's clean it okay by the archaeologists by around 1958 to 65 okay that's when they did the uh, excavation yeah i do trust you have had a wonderful experience watching today's episode we have learned a lot about Kilwa Kisiwani. It indeed has a lot of ancient history and there's still much more to learn. The southeastern region of Tanzania is often neglected by travelers who visit Tanzania, but in my view it shouldn't be. It definitely has a lot to offer, from amazing beaches and coastline, and to its greatest treasure, its people, welcoming and friendly when you visit their town. Definitely give the southeastern region a try when you come to Tanzania. My name is Wemba Imani and thank you for watching Inspire for Travel. Ma salam, kwaheri.